Okay. Good? Okay. A great catcher is a leader and takes charge of the field. He's out. What a, play by a great catcher is one that is highly respected by teammates. Gary, he was more than a teammate to me. He was like a brother. But there was a tension between them. They felt it. They sensed it. He said, I regret that so many of us turned away from him. He was right, and we were wrong. Fastball head deep to left field. It's going, going, gone, gone, gone. There was a reason why they called him the kid. He loved what he did. This is what Gary was all about. He was about winning. Up the middle, base hit. Carter wins it. I'm so honored to be in Cooperstown as a Hall of Famer. I love you all. God bless you. Dad is now faced with a different opponent than the Red Sox, Yankees, or Cubs. He is now faced with cancer. I am deeply saddened to tell you that... Okay, this is going to be a hard one. Okay. His fight really helped us know that he wasn't ever going to give up, and we should never give up either. Monday, day one, May 23rd, 2011. Hey everyone, this is Kimmy, Gary's middle daughter. First and foremost, I wanna thank you for all the unbelievable voice messages, emails, texts, Facebook posts, articles, and most of all, prayers. We are all in awe of how many people. When dad was first getting the symptoms of just not feeling good and we weren't really sure what was going on, people were wanting to know more and of course wanted to know the journey. And somebody had told me about a thing called Caring Bridge and I could do this online journal. Then everybody got to read the story and they got to pray with us and cry with us and be with us in this entire journey of my dad's sickness. Right now we are just waiting and praying. We are relaxing as much as we can until we get a phone call from the doctor. When they said brain cancer, well, I almost didn't believe it. Because, you know, as a little girl, you look up to your dad. And he was always larger than life. He always could do anything. He was always so strong. And like any sort of obstacle in his way, he just would overcome it. So when the tumor came about, I just kind of, it just hit us hard. I just broke down. I lost it and was just hysterical. He's like, I'm going to think of it as I'm going into fight. I'm going into battle. He just said, I'm going to fight this. I was listening to a voicemail that I still have on my phone. And you know, he just kept on assuring me. He's like, I'm going to be OK. I'm going to be OK. Hey, D, Dad, I just want to let you know I'm OK. All right? Please don't panic or worry or anything like that. I'm, I'll be OK, son. OK? All right, I love you, bye. And he said, you know what? You might not get the diagnosis or the journey that you choose, but it's God's journey. And you just fight like heck. And I just think that he showed that in sports, but he showed that when he fought like heck in cancer. And I feel like he's teaching me every single day, even to this moment. When I have the hardest days, I see my dad saying, come on put your shoes on, get up, you can do this. And I think his fight really helped us, you know, know that he wasn't ever gonna give up and we should never give up either. Hey, hey Bunch, right. I think you'll flip over my friend, Gary Carter of the Montreal Expos. Hey, all right, let's, right. Go. let's, let's do it. Let's go. Now I knew all the rumors about how he was one guy when the light was on and the microphones were in front of him and a somewhat different person when they weren't. Gary was the player that you, I think everyone loved to hate. Well, he was the player that you didn't like. Okay now, Sherman, now all you gotta do is take a pitch and this chicken's goose is cooked. Gary presented himself as this really superhuman, super nice guy. 
and to players, no one could be that nice all the time. And he knew where the, always knew where the camera was. His nickname was Camera Carter. Well, King Keith, of course, had been watching him for, you know, five, six, seven years. And, uh, you know, maybe they had their own feelings about how they felt about him, but he also probably kicked their ass for five or six years. High fly ball, left field, way back. That ball is up, up, and away! A home run for Gary Carter! When he was with Montreal, he was considered one of the best players in baseball. Other than Johnny Bench, there has never been a catcher who put together the two parts of the game the way Gary did. He had a wonderful throwing arm. He was a great commander of the game behind the plate. You talk to any pitcher who worked with him, and they'll tell you that he knew the league as well as any catcher did, and he would wheel pitchers through games. You combine that with the offense, and uh, he was a stunning player. In 1979 or 80, there's no way to quantify how bad the Mets were. I mean, that was really a, a dark age. When the ownership changed and Frank Cashin took over in February of 1980, there was so much to be done. It was basically a system bereft of young, upcoming talent. And so they really had their work cut out to restock it and retool it. And they did when they drafted Darryl Strawberry. They drafted Dwight Gooden. They had nurtured guys like Lane Dykstra and Wally Backman in the minor leagues. They had traded for Keith in 83. So the, the pieces were beginning to be assembled. So 1984 was the breakthrough year, the year everybody was waiting for. They won 90 games, established themselves as legitimate contenders, but they still had some holes, and one of them was behind the plate. I don't remember where I was that December day, but this is a while ago now, okay? So there were no cell phones, there was no internet, there was no all sports radio. So I knew nothing of what had just transpired until I got home. I got a message from someone who said very excitedly, the Mets got Gary Carter. And I went, holy smokes. For whatever they wanted to say about his personality, his love of the camera, there's no greater entry point to any team, any clubhouse, any dugout than Hall of Fame skill. Was I thrilled? Absolutely. I knew it was the last cog, and I knew that Gary was a premier catcher. I know his knees were going bad on him, and he was getting older, but he was still productive, and he called a great game, and I knew he would be perfect for our young starting rotation. It was what we needed. 84, we fell short. We needed a catcher, and we got a, an all-star catcher, one of the best in the game. I was just ecstatic. We had kind of the culture of winning with Keith, you know, as our patriarch of that ball club. And then once we got kid, now we had the best first baseman. We had the best right fielder. You take our pitching staff, it's one of the best. We had the best catcher. So it started to make us uh, into a real weapon. I've saved this uh, right ring finger for that World Series ring. He had an all-star Hall of Fame aura. Once he got the spring training, you know, it, it changed our club. We were getting Gary, a guy that we didn't really like, but as time went on, we began to see that Gary was who he is. This is who Gary really is. And he became one of the guys. He became, he became a man. Hi, everybody, and welcome to opening day, 1985. And we welcome you to the 1985. Batting cleanup. He hit 27 homers and led the National League with 106 RBIs. Gary Carter. Thursday, May 26, 2011. Dad has had a good day today. He has been very kind to everyone, soft spoken, a little confused, but mostly just tired. He has a great attitude, but is scared of the unknown as we all are. We are thinking positive, and we know you all are praying for my sweet dad, and we are not in this battle alone. Five to five, last half of the 10th inning. Tomorrow, dad will have his biopsy. I wish the biopsy could be in the middle of a baseball stadium so dad could hear the roar of the crowd. Curve, well hit, deep to left field, way back in May. Home 
Dad loves to hear clapping, cheering, and lots of enthusiasm. They're yelling, Gary, Gary, Gary. So let's get rowdy for the kid. There's pressure every year to perform. And when you're a star player and you have a big contract, there's more pressure to perform. And especially in New York, there's pressures that go along with that. But Gary was always a big game player. You know, he always had good all-star games. Uh, when the bright lights were there, he was a guy that thrived in that. So I was never worried that he would be one of those players that could not perform in New York. I knew he would be able to. Fastball head deep to left field. It's going, going, gone, goodbye. Gary Carter. So many stars do come to New York and they have sort of culture shock. And it's powerful. It's, it's very weighty. It can be intimidating. And great players have succumbed to it. And Gary was great from day one. Gary Carter was betting cleanup for the Mets. And oh, did Carter clean up on the San Diego Padres. Gary hits three home runs, six RBIs, as the Mets beat San Diego 8-3. to three. He loved playing. That's one. And loved the spotlight. That's two. He loved the spotlight. A lot of guys don't love the spotlight. And there's number three. You know, they just soon, I'm one of those people, I just soon sit back and kind of watch things go on. Gary loved the spotlight. He really did. Oh, yeah. Gary wasn't shy. Hey, Gary! Is this the way they deliver papers in New York? Being associated with corporations through endorsements couldn't be any better than uh, what's happening here in New York. In this tough town, giving it your all is what counts. So thanks, Gary. You know, he had to carry that mantle in, in Montreal because he was the guy. You know, he was the show. And I think he, he got that and he embraced it. And he's like, it's cool. And then he came here, which if you like the spotlight, where else you want to go but New York City? So then when he came here, it was just a perfect fit for a guy who was the guy in Montreal and no one cared. Now he's the guy in New York where everybody cares. Friday, May 27, 2011. Thank you all for your constant prayers and support over the past several days as we all awaited answers for dad's condition. After the biopsy was completed this morning, we anxiously awaited news on what is causing dad's tumors. It is with a heavy yet hopeful heart that I share with you the news that Dr. Friedman shared with our family early this afternoon. He is 90% certain that the tumors are malignant. It was very hard for all of us to hear as we have been hoping and praying that the tumors would be benign. Lots of tears have been shed in the hospital room today and we are all a little bit scared of the unknown. Dr. Freeman said that this is treatable and they will attack it with the same kind of vigor that dad displayed on the baseball diamond. Plain and simple, dad loves to win. He is a competitor and he wants to win every game. My prayer is that dad will win this new battle. It isn't going to be a fun game like baseball, but it is a fight and dad hates to lose. Gary was an intense competitor in, in all situations. There's no way they're gonna pitch to Hernandez now. You're not gonna let Hernandez beat you. They're gonna leave it up to Carter, I'm sure. Anybody that has any pride in performance, you know, that's, I've had people walk in front of me to get to me. So that's when you really want to make sure that they pay the price for that. That's really, you know, backing you up against it and you want to prove the manager wrong. And this one deep to left, on, goodbye. He was such a, he was so exuberant when he high-fived me about, you know, he about took my hand off. I think as far as the competitive part of him and the part that rubbed me the wrong way when we first came together as a, a battery, is that he had this habit, if he didn't like the pitch you threw, he used to fire the ball back. And uh, the first couple of times he did it, I did not like it. I was like, uh, fire back as much as you want. I'm like, bring it on. And then after a while, I figured it out. You know, he expected as much from me as he expected from himself. That was his way of, of kind of waking you up. Instead of making a visit to the mound, as so many catchers do now, he just used to fire 100 mile an hour seed back at you. That was his way on the field to let you know that, hey, listen, I'm competing at a high level. I expect you to do the same. 
This is what Gary was all about. When he's at the ballpark, this is what Gary was all about. He's about winning, ways of winning. He would watch his film after he played. So he played a four-hour game, five-hour game, whatever, how long it took. And then he would go home and he would pop it in, pop the VHS in and watch the whole thing over because mom would have it recorded. He would, he would watch it, but that's what made him so good. He wasn't just satisfied with what happened. He wanted to advance. My dad has the perfect nickname, The Kid. He loves life and loves people. He is enthusiastic and passionate. I am so proud to be his daughter. There was a reason why they called him The Kid. You know, he lit up while he was on the field. You know, he did what he loved, and, you know, I respect the heck out of that. You know, I mean, I love that he loved what he did. He was a very upbeat guy. Gary sort of was the shining light in that clubhouse. Ball hit well left center. Gapper. One run scored. Two run scored. Just clean the bases. Five nothing Mets. And now it was fun to be around them because there was a real winning culture. There was a sense that, you know, something great is building here. The National League came away from the 85 season thinking, we're going to have a problem next year with these guys. Steve Zabriskie along with Tim McCarver as we get set to open what should be an outstanding Mets baseball season before a packed house. And Timmy, this is the most excitement we've seen since we've been with the ball club, that's for sure. The 1986 Mets were the most incredible team I've ever covered. They were the most fun to cover. They were the most vibrant. They were most charismatic. And they captured the city in a way I have not seen in all my years as a baseball writer. That clubhouse was a different place to be, you know. It was, uh, it was loud and it was boisterous and you better be able to take a dagger out because it was coming. Don't have a bad outfit coming in, don't have a bad day the day before, all of those things. It was just the hardest and most beautiful place I've ever been. But Gary, well, he was just different. I mean, he was 100% straight-laced running with a team that ran fast and ran hard. And Gary didn't run in those circles. You know, Gary would just as soon go out to a nice, quiet dinner, get back to the hotel room, and get ready for the next game. Now, 25-man roster, at least 23 of us would meet back downstairs to go eat, and obviously hit the town. A couple times he had to put me in the bed. I'll admit that. I guess Lenny was up real late one night and causing a ruckus and, like, was banging on my dad's door, and my dad, like lifted up Lenny, it was like, you gotta go to bed, and like this whole thing, and it's just funny to think of him kind of like pushes buttons. Gary was his own person, everybody was a different individuals. Gary was a different uh, breed of cat in his own way, much different than me. Keith had a very complicated relationship with Gary, there's no question. We had a lot of things in common, we had a lot of things not in common. I mean, that goes with every teammate. Gary was, a, was married, I wasn't married. He was a family man, a man of faith. I'm a man of faith, I don't go to church, but I'm a man of faith, but we're just two different people. They were both great players and both essential to the Mets' success, but you couldn't find two players and two personalities who were more different. There was a tension between them because I don't think that Gary necessarily approved of Keith's lifestyle, and I don't think that, that Keith was enamored with the way Gary loved the press and wanted attention. But both were mature enough and professional enough to never let it become an open wound. I mean, you never would have seen Gary and Keith fighting. That would have never happened between Carter and Hernandez. They were just, they were just too accomplished in their careers. They were both intelligent, mature guys, and that would not have played out in the public's eye ever. He was one that did not judge others. So it didn't matter what happened off the field. To him, he wanted to have whatever it took as a team to win. So it didn't matter where you came from, what your background was, what your lifestyle was like. Let's be a team and let's win this game. That's all he cared about. 
The common denominator of that club was we wanted to win. They're spreading the news that they are right now the dominant team in this game, in either league. So with that comes a lot of fanfare and a lot of action and, and uh, a lot of uh, getting the people out of their seats. And they, they wanted the curtain calls and the fans demanded it and they called for it and Gary was, was gonna oblige. That's why I, th I think other teams really despise those. You know, he had that 80s curly hair thing going on. You know, he had a lot of reasons not to like him if you didn't know him. I mean, I didn't like him when I didn't know him. <laughs> oh, man, Gary, wow. Gary was, I mean, he earned the name the kid. He really, really did. He jumping up and down, you no know, cheerleading. And sometimes we would look at him and say, Gary, OK, all right, we get it. But it became more amusing than anything else because it was so him. Ball well hit, left center field. This ball is out of here. Gary Carter puts the Mets on top. But that was a ball club that we could care less if you like. We actually liked that you didn't like us. That made us happy. Because if the other guys like you, you're doing something wrong. The New York Mets become champions of the National League's Eastern Division for 1986. Being a part of this ball club and winning and starting from the very beginning and going all the way here and winning it big, God, it's just wonderful. We just feel that we're, our chances are great. Uh, now we've got about the last three weeks to kind of prepare ourselves and get ourselves ready for those playoffs and all. And then when that time comes, then we're going to go like gangbusters. The Mets rolled into October believing they were absolutely bulletproof. But Houston was great, and they were not afraid of the Mets. They had Nolan Ryan. Uh, they had Mike Scott. Mike Scott really had our number. He really did. He was cheating. Everybody knows he was cheating. But he was good at it. It worked. And he was in our guy's head. He was blowing their minds because, you know, they were so worried about him scuffing the ball that they put this pressure on themselves. That was a game with a sense of urgency. We said to ourselves, if we have to come out and face Mike Scott on game seven, we were in big trouble. So we needed to win game five. And I remember it was Charlie Kerfell. It was two outs. I didn't feel great the whole series at the plate. And I'm going, oh boy, I'm going to be on my back up against it unless they walk me. And I really, to tell you the truth, I was kind of relieved they walked me. But it put it on Gary. And I'm sure that I would have responded. I mean, if they didn't walk me, what are you going to do? You got to get the plate and hit. You have to understand that that was a very, very tough series for Carter. I think he'd been one for 21. And earlier in the series, in a big spot, Gary hit a comebacker to the mound, and Kerfell grabbed it on one hop. And he showed the ball to Gary before he threw him out. Back to the mound. Behind the back grab by Kerfell, and he throws out Carter. <laughs> I thought that was disrespectful. I thought that was taunting. I'm telling you, he catches it. Now watch what he does to Carter. Watch. He's going to point to him. So if I felt that way, I could only imagine how Gary felt. Winning run is now at second base. Bottom of the 12th inning. 1-1 one, one tie. Charlie Kerfeld and Gary Carter dueling here. Tuesday, May 31st, 2011. This will not be an easy road at all, nor is this a simple battle, but we will fight. Up the middle, base hit. Backman turns third. Hatcher's throw, no play. Carter wins it. He came through with the base up the middle. And that just shows what kind of uh, heart he had, competitiveness, and determination. Let's all be great teammates for Dad and do whatever it takes to win. Battle like Dad played, with enthusiasm, passion, and a positive mind. We're a tough family. We're a really tough family. and to combat this, this cancer. Uh, he, he never gave up. He never gave up. Tuesday, June 7, 2011. It has not been easy to see my dad go through tough times. He is one of the most independent, fun-loving people I've ever known. He has always taken care of the family. 
Throughout these four weeks, Dad mentions how he doesn't want to be an inconvenience to anyone. Even if he is having a hard day, he checks in with each family member to make sure everyone is doing okay. Fastball, high drive into left field. Rice is looking up. She is gone. Home run, Carter. His heart is good, so loving and so caring. Each one of us are proud of Dad. He is a good man with a great heart. And he's hit another one. A towering smash. Rice never even moved. Friday, June 17th, 2011. Today was the first day of radiation, and I'm happy to report that it went very well. Dad is ready and determined to take on these six weeks, like game six. Everybody sitting very quietly of that New York Mets dugout. Hoping, I guess, hope that something will start to happen. And Gary Carter at the plate. I can't even fathom the pressure of standing up there knowing you might be the last out of the World Series. I, complete utter sickness, as my mom would say, because we thought, oh no, this he can't, he'll not forgive himself. And Roger Clemens hoping for that last out. There was an actual flash up on the screen that said, congratulations, Red Sox, champions, the whole thing. And he was up to bat, and he's like, oh, no, this is not OK. There's a determination in Gary's at bat. I mean, not a, we're down to, there's two outs, there's nobody. I mean, this is, is, uh, this is right when a guy can roll over. This is right when a guy go, well, you know what, we had a good year, but whatever didn't see that. You look at that at bat. That at bat they should show to every high school kid, every rookie, everybody who's trying to be somebody. So that's an at bat for the ages. That was a guy who was determined not to compete, but to get a hit, not leave that out. That's dad, the most determined man I've ever met. Do not get in his way. You want to be on his team for sure. If you're not on his team, you're probably going to lose. Lined into left field, base hit for Carter, and the Mets are still alive. And uh, then things started rolling after that. And a line drive, base hit into center field. A soft line drive, it'll be a base hit in the center field. Carter will score. Mitchell will go. Gets away. Gets away. Here comes Mitchell. Here comes Mitchell. Every statistic in the book says we should have lost. <laughs> Little roller up along first, behind the back, it gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight, and the Mets win it. And Gary started. It was it. Never give up attitude that he had. being a part of something that was very special here and within the Met organization, which up to that point it only had 69 and a lot of losing seasons. It was very, very special. I think everybody, if you talk to anybody on the team, that they feel the same way. It's a sense of accomplishment and pride that what we, we accomplished, that's the coaching staff, the manager, front office, and the players. When you battle together and when you succeed together and especially when you win championships together, it creates an indelible bond that just can't be broken no matter what the, the different personalities, the disparate things that happen off the field. When, when you battle together like that and succeed, it lasts forever. For the 1987 New York Mets, spring training began with high expectations. Just a few months before, Davey Johnson's team had won a world championship and now appeared capable of taking another. But just before camp broke, so did the Mets luck. We didn't see the best of Gary Carter. You have to remember, his best years were with the Montreal Expos. But by 87, it was clear and evident 
that the number of innings, the amount of games, the hard games had taken a toll. It was at times sad. Gary Carter, who flied out to right, is now seven for his last 50 with men in scoring position. This was not only a player in decline, but someone who was obviously frustrated. Tuesday, June 21st, 2011. I don't understand why this is happening, but I know I have a peace knowing this is all part of God's plan. Part of Gary thought he could just always play, that he would play 25 years or something, because that's how much he loved the game. Yes, his body was taking a toll, and he ended up having 12 knee surgeries, two replacements, and plus a whole bunch of other surgeries, but he played in pain. Well, some of the hazards are certainly the foul tips and collisions at home plate and, um, you know, just keeping your hands free from, uh, from injury and things like that. But, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate. Um, you know, I have had a lot of injuries and all, but for the most part, I've been very lucky. When I see these videos of him playing, it's like he's the happiest person in the whole world, knowing that he's coming home to ice, getting cortisone shots, injections in him, in his neck. Instead of calling you the kid, they're going to call you the kid, cortisone kid oh, or something geez. like that. You've been shooting that pretty good, too, haven't you? Well, I have had quite a few uh, cortisone shots this year, Ralph, and it's only just due to the, the little nagging injuries and all that, that occur. And uh, um, somebody started calling me a Father Time and everything, because I'm <laughs> starting to crumble a little bit. But uh, I'm hanging in there. You know. Tuesday, August 2nd, 2011. Dad is still not walking and losing some strength in his legs, but still very strong in things like shaking hands with him. There's a lot of things that were out of his control. He had not just the brain cancer, but he had kidney stones. He fell really hard and he broke his rotator cuff. He had all kinds of sores. He had all kinds of things that went on. I just couldn't believe that this was happening to the strongest man I've ever met. One of the greatest things about being a catcher is the fact that you are the captain of the ship. This captain has to play with passion and excitement for the game, not only because you want to, but because your teammates are all looking at you. I'm guessing it was refreshing for dad's teammates to see their captain run their ship with a big smile and a fired up spirit. I'm Frank Cashin, the general manager of the New York Mets. And I'm Keith Hernandez, captain of the New York Mets. I do remember Keith being named captain, and I do remember there was a very powerful bond between Keith and Davey. And in fact, I would have to say that Keith was almost the co-manager of the team. Davey was very, very generous in delegating power and authority in the clubhouse to Keith. He held a meeting about how we were playing, da, 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 and he said, oh, and by the way, I'm going to name Keith captain. And I was like, holy cow. I had no idea that was coming. And I know that Gary wasn't happy about it. Keith was the captain. He'd been there a little longer. He had brought a culture of winning from St. Louis over to the club. He had the great ability to be able to ride that beautiful fence between, you know, the, the quieter players and the more raucous players. And everyone on that team's soul, they kind of knew that Keith was the captain. Sometimes it's an over, way, way overrated thing. It probably meant more to, to people on the outside. Probably meant something to Kid because, you know, Kid liked that. He liked that stuff. It bothered him. So eventually next year, I think it was next year, he was named co-captain. In kind of a, a respect way, they knew that they were both in, in leadership roles. And so it worked. It worked for our clubhouse. And at that point, the Mets were young, and they were single for the most part, and New York loved them, and New York was a, an, just one big nonstop party. Cocaine was huge in that era. Gooden had tested positive, and then it wasn't long before Strawberry went into rehab, and then you're dealing with these two superstars that look like they're Hall of Fame bound, already having these kind of problems. You, at that point, you didn't know where it was headed. Gary, he was more than a teammate to me. He was like a brother. 
on road trips to Doc, you okay? How's everything? He didn't talk baseball besides the games that I would pitch. He basically talked about what was going on in my life, and, and that meant a lot because he didn't come in and say, hey, get ready, you know, we need you back on the field. And just say, hey, right now you focus on him saving your life. Even during the offseason, he would call me, hey, Doc, what's going on? What are you doing today? What are you doing yesterday? What are you doing the weekend? I have most respect for Gary for that because he cared for me more as a person than a baseball player. He came alongside of them as a, not a mentor, but as a leaning post, I mean, especially being in a leadership role. Um, those type of things are, are leadership uh, qualities in guys that it, it, the game's bigger than just themselves. They're thinking about the other teammate. Gary did that. I know Keith has done that. Just quality people reaching out and helping other people. But there's not much, I think, that Gary could have done to help Doc and Daryl. He just didn't live that life. He was not in that mindset. He couldn't have understood addiction, drugs, alcohol. It was just totally alien to him. Although, ironically, you know, I spoke to Daryl not long ago, and he said, you know, looking back now, you know, 30 years later, I wish I had listened to Gary. I wish I had let Gary reach out to me or I had re reached out to him. He was a man. He was the one who understood how to live your life. And if I had more people in my life like Gary Carter, I would have ended up the way I did. And I regret that so many of us turned away from him or ignored him. He was right, and we were wrong. Towards the end, when he was sick, he just said, Doc, look, I don't know how much longer I got, but let's make a deal here. He goes, um, I want you to make a promise to me. I said, OK. He goes, fight those demons you got to fight. You do what you got to do for your recovery to touch lives, and so I'm going to battle my situation to the end as best I can to touch other lives as well. I said, that's the deal. He said, you promised that. I said, I promise you that. And that's the last conversation we had. There's a drive way back. It might be the 300th home run of his career. Everybody is happy for Gary Carter. As the cancer progressed, he was not able to get up. And so I was the sole person to lift him up at, out of bed and, and bring him to bed. And I had to physically maneuver him all around the house. It was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Dad also teaches a lot about being a great teammate. I never was a teammate of his on the baseball clay, but I know I would have loved to have played on the same team with him. Now it is possible to be Gary Carter's teammate. The whole Mets team, I mean, they, they were very kind and reaching out at the time. Daryl Strawberry in particular. And it was just such a beautiful thing to see the impact that my, my dad had on people. And it's hard not to <laughs> fight back the tears, you know? Tons of people reached out. You could just tell the love because he loved others, because he knew how to love. He knew how to love his teammates despite their backgrounds. He knew how to love the game. He knew how to love his family the right way. He just knew how to love. He had a lot of love in his body, and he knew how to give it. And so I feel like it was his turn now. It was his turn to get that love in return. Thursday, January 19th, 2012. This past week has been one of the hardest weeks for my dad. Every day is exhausting and every move takes great effort. Just a few moments ago, my mom received a phone call from Dr. V at Duke, and I wish I could say that these results were good. Dr. V told my mom that there are now several new spots and tumors on my dad's brain. I write these words with tears because I'm so sad for my dad. Dr. Jimmy Harris will be coming to my parents' house this evening to talk to the family about the next step. Dr. Harris told us that dad's timeline was three to eight weeks. Well, it wasn't even certain that Gary was gonna come back in 1989. I don't think it was till the winter before that they made it clear that he was still gonna be the number one catcher, but you know, his knees were so deteriorated at that point. It was so hard for him to keep himself on the field every day. I think Gary played maybe 50 games in 1989, still played his heart out. Clearly, he was not going to leave until he had given every ounce that he had. 
February 12, 2012. At hospice, mom, Christy, DJ, and myself were all with dad. We spent time and cried in sadness at what dad is going through. We all told him that we loved him so much. When Christy left, dad was able to get enough energy to say I love you back to her. Same with when I said goodbye. He said I love you under his breath to me. DJ had about an hour alone with dad and said his goodbyes. Mom said her goodbyes too with tears. He was upbeat all the time. He never seemed to have a bad day, even though you knew how difficult it was for him at that point in his career. He was always accommodating. He was always friendly. And I think that's a measure of who he was. He'd known, Keith knew as well, that that was their swan song as Mets that night. In fact, I had heard in absolute terms before the game and went with it on the air that this was it for Keith Hernandez and Gary Carter. Neither were going to be back next year. And it had really been a foregone conclusion. So however many fans were at Shea Stadium that night knew it, they felt it, they sensed it, and they wanted to show their appreciation. This is quite a sight to see Keith getting this standing ovation. I was too emotional. I couldn't focus and concentrate. And uh, they gave us a standing ovation. It was, very, it was a very emotional one for me. It was big. I mean, people really loved these guys. They were such a huge piece of the Mets' success through the 80s and the knowledge that this was the last time they were going to get to see them at Chase Stadium. It was, uh, it was palpable. Is Gary Carter catching his last inning here at Shea Stadium. We have minimal conversations with Dad, but he always tells us he loves us, and he usually says, I love you more. He said, take care of your mom, and I'm going right to heaven, and you know where I'm going to be, and I'm going to see you again one day. We each got a special time with him in the hospital, and I looked at him, and he was just closing his eyes, and I said, I just love you so much. Just show me one thing that you can hear my voice, that you know. And he opened one eye and just looked at me and then closed it. So I knew he fought like anything to just let me know that he heard me. Since coming to the Mets in 1985, he has been perhaps the most popular New York Mets player, Gary Carter. Thursday, February 16th, 2012. Hello to Team Carter. I am deeply saddened to tell you that my precious dad went to be with Jesus today at 4.10 p.m. This is the most difficult thing I've ever had to write in my life, but I wanted you all to know. He is in heaven and is reunited with his mom and dad. And he is going out for a pinch runner. I believe with all my heart that dad had had a standing ovation as he walked through the gates of heaven. He is now in no pain and is the most beautiful angel. All right, we have to stop the show for a second and change things up. Sad news just into SMY mm. about Mets great Gary Carter. We are hearing that he has succumbed to the brain tumor he has been suffering from. We now bring on the phone Keith Hernandez, who joins us in Keith. I just have to ask you your first thought upon hearing this. I know it's great sadness, but what is your first thought upon hearing this? Well, it's uh, obviously it's great sadness, and um, you kind of tend to block it out. And now it's here. 
It's very sad. You know, I had great respect for him. The way he approached his life and the game. Doggone it, I wish I said some things before he did leave that maybe I, I left on unsaid. But uh, I can say one thing, you know, at some point in time we'll be re reunited um, and uh, we'll talk about the game a little bit maybe. G Gary was a part of us that um, I think all of us miss uh, because, you know, he stayed with us. And when we see each other sometimes, yeah, we, 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 we talk about Gary. He's a special person, and he's always have a special place in his team because of his personality, because of who he was. You know, he deserved no less. Here to represent charismatic 11-time All-Star and baseball Hall of Famer Gary Carter, please welcome Gary's wife, Sandy, and son, DJ. My dad was that model for me. I'm able to have that same passion and that same desire he had. So I'm very, very grateful for him because I, I wouldn't be where I am today without him, without a doubt. It's not about the game as much as it is how much he loved me and my mom and my sister and brother. He just, he loved us. He genuinely loved us. And I'm just proud to be his daughter because he lived the way all of us should live. We used to always say he could walk into a room and make anybody feel like a million bucks. He, you know, instilled that in us, is make a difference, inspire somebody. So that I hold very, very close to my heart.